1 Corinthians. Last week I said, I want to make you Corinthians. I, I don't want to make you Corinthians. I, don't, I really don't want to make you Corinthians. That is not a good thing to be because these guys had a lot of challenge and a lot of difficulty and a lot of trouble. And if you remember from last week, um, we looked at some of the background. We looked at some of the uh, challenges that those in Corinth were facing. But if you really think about it, the, the challenges that they faced are really no different than the challenges we face today. Their culture affected their thinking. And before you were a believer, did not everything about everything that you've grown up with, your life, your family, your home, etc., affect your thinking? Okay, after you're a believer, of course, that all gets erased, right? No, it doesn't. I mean, it really doesn't. We carry with us, if you will, baggage. I mean, this is the, the difference is we can progress from it. It can be something that we're not controlled by. But if you remember, Corinth had just had Paul come there three years earlier from the, basically the time, best estimate of the time of writing of 1 Corinthians. Three years earlier. So how much growth in the first three years do you think these guys had? What do you think? Oh. Okay, not a lot. A lot? Okay, good. We've got both bookends covered now. A lot and not a lot. Some. Some. There it is. There was some growth. That's how it works, yes. There was some growth, yeah. So that makes it easy. We know there was some growth. Um, but you know, there, there would be some growth, right? But it's not going to be all equal. It's not going to be always in the same area. It's not always going to be um, as one would think about it. I mean, it's not like you're, you're going through, hey, look, I'm going to go through this thing and I've got everything laid out. Okay, well, John, you got to work on you know, understanding your role as a single guy. Okay, Jonathan, you've got to worry about your being a husband. Wait a second, now I'm, how, how am I going to do that? i got two, two different guys here. How do I get them to grow? How do I change them? Well, God is the one who's doing that. But he's doing that within the context of their life of their background, just like he does with all of us. So some people don't struggle with certain elements of life, do they? So, <laughs> no big deal. And then other people, it's like that same thing is a huge deal. Trusting. If you, if you, if you come from a background where you never could trust anything that was happened, where do you think you might struggle? In that. If you came from a highly super intellectual background, what might be one of your challenges? What do you think? Faith. Faith, because you have to know, right? I got to prove it all out, right? And now trusting, oh, wait a second, I'm sorry that you didn't dot this last period here, the decimal place is off, so how could I possibly believe any of this is real, right? You might struggle with that. If you come from a culture, like we saw with Corinth, that prestige was really important, how important I look. And so what we're going to see as we open up this letter, we're going to see each and every one of those uh, challenges uh, coming about. I do need my notes. Yes, it would be really handy. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The others are coming, but I would like my notes. That was a good stall, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> Because for, for some reason, I haven't memorized every one of these things in here. But the, um, a, a, as we, we walk into this, we're going to see that Paul's going to start addressing some of the challenges that Corinth has because of their background, their culture, their upbringing. And it's derailing and causing problems within the church itself, not because, okay, they don't know what's stated, by the way, they didn't have the letter to the Corinthians yet, right? So, <laughs> have you ever thought about that? Hey, the Corinthians were really off. They should have read that. Oh, wait a second. They didn't have that letter yet. <laughs> How many of you would like your, uh, a letter written to you in the first three years of your Christianity and you said, well, you should have known all this, right? <laughs> no. 
Uh, th that's that's why, why people have to be instructed. It doesn't just come natural. It's just not, wow, look, I've got it all laid out. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at how Paul takes even his greeting, and then we're going to see, you know, as he lays, lays out what's going to happen. We're going to see even how he phrases his greeting to start addressing the challenges that these people are facing. And isn't it, 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 it I, I always marvel at that Paul could take a greeting and teach from it. Isn't it amazing? Hi, I'm going to teach you in a greeting. Now, the first thing I want to tell you about this greeting is this is a standard greeting for the time. This is a, you know, I don't know what they use in colleges now or schools now. We used to use the MLA style guide, right? Here's how you're supposed to write a business letter. Here's how you write a personal letter. Here's how you write a whatever letter type of thing. In the military, there were all sorts of forms and formats of kind of letters you had to write and how you had to write them and phrase them and woe be unto you if you did it wrong. <laughs> But here, Paul is going to write a letter to the Corinthians in the same structure that anybody else would have written a letter. So if you notice here, these letters aren't going, wow, this just came up out of nowhere, and this is how you write a godly letter. Now, this is how you write a letter in a godly way. There's a difference. So he uses their structure, because we don't, we don't address things like that. But... His greeting, and this is the basic formula of how, how letters were written at that time, is first off, it is greetings from either A to B, you know, this to this, or this person to this, or this group to this, or from B, or to B from A, okay? So they, they, they can rearrange the order, but it's the same kind of structure. We typically don't write letters like that. We go, Dear Bill, right? And then at the end, we sign, sincerely, thanks, blessings, whatever, and put your name. That's kind of how we write. If we're writing a personal letter, it's, hi, Paul, to the Corinthians. Right? And that's what he's going to do. The second thing is, typically, there was a warm wish or prayer or welcome or greeting kind of idea. So I'm going to talk to you in a way that is warm and shows some affection towards you. The third thing was thanks to whatever deity, so in this case to God, but it could have been to Isis, it could have been to Artemis, it could have been to whoever, or gods or goddesses or whatever. There was a thanks to that God and then something why. And so the why typically was associated with either the person or the group that they were um, addressing. So, hi, you guys. It's from me. I wish you well. I give thanks to my God for whatever reason. All right? Does that make sense? So when you read the New Testament letters of Paul, that's basically you're going to see those elements in it. Now, how he changes them around, how he moves them, how he adjusts them, you know, that's what makes it a Christian letter, but using the same form. So we're going to look, look here at the first three verses, and we're going to see what he does and how he does it. Let me read this to you, and I think this is the ESV version. Um, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, and our brother Th Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus, call together to be saints with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is still the greetings. We haven't got to the Thanksgiving part yet. That's going to be the next section, just so you know. You didn't see any Thanksgiving there. That's that's the next section. But notice what he does. Paul identifies himself. Now, he doesn't say, hi, it's Paul. So there could have been a lot of Pauls around. He wants to identify who he is who's writing this letter. And he doesn't say, hi, I'm Paul of Tarsus. Right? Hi, I'm the Paul that used to be this way. But now I'm, I used to be Saul, now I'm Paul. 
He doesn't, he doesn't introduce himself that way, but he does introduce himself in a way that is already going to start addressing some of these challenges to him from the Corinthians, which we will see later. Now you go, well, how, isn't that cheating reading ahead? Well, they already knew this. He already knew this. So he starts right off the bat with all that pre, pre-existing knowledge, and we can see that what he does here is going to be expanded upon later in the letter. So what does he do? He starts off, he says, Paul, called by the will of God. All right. So, what's the very first thing he is telling the Corinthians in his greeting about their relationship and what's going to be going on? What's going to happen? He's laying down his credentials. Okay, he's laying down his credentials. Well, what's, what about his credentials? God has called him to this position. Okay, God has called him to this position. If you notice here, it wasn't, I was appointed by the church in Antioch to be an apostle. I was not sanctioned by some people, right? Now, is there a difference between that? I mean, yeah, a lot of people say, yes, I was called to be a minister. Well, were you called like Paul was? Well, certainly not dramatically, that's for sure. Um, But... He makes it very clear. I'm not doing this because I said, hey, I'm Paul. I'm great. Everybody said, yes, you were top in your seminary, so you're called. Let's go. He goes, no, I was called by God. I was called by the will of God. This is God's... Well, no, the, 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 the title at the top is wrong. The notes are correct, or I hope the notes are correct. (laughs) Sometimes you make copy, paste, and forget to edit or save. That's the bad thing about computers. If you forget to save them, they're not looking at the phone. (laughs) So he starts off with that. And then he says, to be what? To be called an apostle, right? He's called to be an apostle. So... That basically was, uh, in theologic terms, is like somebody who, depending on what standard you put, somebody that Jesus has basically appointed. Uh, but in the general sense, it was, I am the one who is called as a representative. It's almost like an ambassador type of an idea. He says, so I'm called by the will of God, and what is my role? I am one called by Christ to represent him. Question? Who is Sosthenes? We'll get to Sosthenes. Just a second. Sosthenes, yes. It's like a special sauce at a French restaurant. Um, I wondered that too. Yeah, so Paul, Paul recognizes this. So he's already establishing his authority, his credentials, his sourcing, and his role just in the beginning of his greeting. All right, so that's like saying, Hi, I'm Bill. I'm the engineer. I designed the space shuttle. Here, you know. So you should listen to me about growing flowers. Oh, wait a second. No, that's not what his role would be. It would be, I'm a guy who builds space shuttles or rockets. So he's identifying what his his role is and who gave it to him. I don't know about you, but messing with the will of God and apostle of Jesus Christ is not something I'd really want to take lightly, nor would I want to say lightly. So this is very important when he starts off. And our brother Sosthenes. Okay, who is Sosthenes? Sosthenes, nobody really knows who he is. However, there are some guesses of who he might be. Um, in Acts 18:17, uh, there is a Sosthenes listed in Corinth as a chief official in the synagogue. All right, which is where Paul was, and he's. He's stated here, and in the Greek, it's not our brother Sosthenes, it's really uh, uh, the brother Sosthenes. So it's very much that it's not just a, any Sosthenes, it's the brother Sosthenes. It's this guy we all know. Now, whether he was the official of the synagogue or not who was saved, we don't know that. But we do know that there was a Sosthenes there in Corinth. And even if it is not that Sosthenes, this is the brother Sosthenes, the one you guys know too. So whoever the guy was, there could have been 50th Sosthenes out there. 
I would kind of lean to say, hmm, who would it probably be as a leader who's with Paul? Probably a guy who was a former head of a synagogue who understood the scriptures and understood what Paul was doing and became a believer. That would be my guess, but we don't know for sure. That would be just kind of reading between the lines. But he could have been Sosthenes from, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. We don't know. Yes, that's why it's probably, he, he is a guy who's right with Paul, and this is, a, this is from Sosthenes too. So that's why it, instead of some random guy, he would be a guy of note to these people. So he's kind of, his weight's being added in here. If you notice, Paul is not a lone ranger, is he? Hey, it's all about me, you know, just pay attention to me. It's like, no, it's me, Paul, here's my job. Oh, by the way, and here's our brother Sosthenes, you know who he is. We're, we're writing this together, so it's just not me. That's why in churches, having a plurality of elders is very helpful. Frustrating, but helpful. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. We, we go and we help churches at times. They go, I'm the lone elder. I want another elder. They get another elder, and then about six weeks later, they go, oh, my gosh, there's another elder. I have to, like, talk and coordinate and all this other kind of stuff. And they have difference of opinions and... That's a good thing, actually. It's a good thing. So, <laughs> Sosthenes, the brother. So, if you notice here, look at all the stuff that's just being unpacked just in the beginning of this greeting. Then, he says, okay, now I'm going to address to who this is for. This is to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, this is to the church of God. Whose church is it? God's church. All right? And the word church there is the English word for the Greek ekklesia, which basically means called out ones or an assembly. And in this particular time, we always think, oh, well, that's just church. Churches didn't exist then. They were brand new, basically. So what would these guys be thinking from their old Corinthian background when they're called an ekklesia? Well, if you look and what ecclesias were, oh, more often than not, they were either political or social groups. How often has the church been called a big social club? Well, what happens that a church becomes a big social club? They forget they're God's church. They're not there for their own benefit and profit, <coughs> though we do benefit and profit by being together, and we should. But that is not what we're called into. We are God's called out assembly. That's a big deal. That's a huge reminder. You're not your own. You're God's. And he, he tells them this. And where are you, this assembly? Oh, by the way, your geography is in Corinth. That's where you are. We are the called out ones of God in Centennial, Colorado. Also noted in subsection compared to other called out ones in this area as Southside Bible Church. So if we think it's about us, we've already missed the point, just like the Corinthians were doing. It wasn't about them. It was about God. He's the one who did the calling. He's the one who's going to, oh, give the gifts. He's the one that's going to be doing all these things, and Paul's going to continue reminding him of that, but he's doing it right up front. And then he says, by the way, you're called out what? Who, who, let me give you a little better description of who you are. You are those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Okay, are you sanctified by yourself? Are you set apart there? Are you, is it about you? No, you're sanctified in Christ. Christ Jesus. That's where you got anything that you got. It's in him, not in you. Is this beginning to ring that what Paul's going to be doing in the rest of this letter? Excuse me. In the rest of this letter, he's going to be challenging them about them. He's already reminding them that it's not about them. Called to be saints, holy ones, set apart ones, and then he goes on, not just you're set apart, together with all of those who, uh, those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and by the way, you guys aren't the only ones out there. 
It's not about the high and mighty Corinthians. Because remember, Corinth was this high and mighty city within the Roman Empire. It's like, no, 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 no. There are other people that are called together that are saints just like you everywhere else. God's church is everywhere. He is calling people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So again, lesson for us, don't sit and go, well, we're us and we're here and we've got all this stuff and therefore we're high and mighty. The people that are out in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, with nothing are still God's called out ones, set apart, holy for him together with us. And they may speak a different language. They may come from a different culture. They may have different things, but they are God's people. We are family. And he says, I want you to remember that. And what do they do? They call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So, he, what did he just say? They, like us, are under his authority. Because what do you think is going to happen here in a few verses when he starts addressing their divisions? He's going to ask them this question. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Do you guys understand whose authority you sit under? See? He's starting to shred. If you just took this opening part and just lived it, lived into it and understood and applied it, well, he probably wouldn't have to write the rest of the letter. And sometimes we forget. These aren't just, ah, yeah, that's Paul. You guys are saying, it's okay, cool, right? Let's move on. This is really important stuff, and he's reminding them of it. Then he goes on and says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is kind of their, the, the, the warmth, the, the desire, if you will, for them, right? I want what? I want grace and peace to you. But where's the source of that grace and peace? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not from Paul. I want, this is my desire, this is my prayer, this is my wish for you, this is what I want, is grace and peace. Have you ever thought about that? How often do we thank God and ask for grace and peace? We ask for stuff and things and jobs and health and all sorts of stuff. When was the last time in your prayer, honestly, did you go, God, I need grace and peace? Matter of fact, that's what I want for my brothers and sisters is grace and peace. Think about what that sums up. Those two words, you know, you expand that and unpack what grace and peace are. That's peace with God. That's peace in trusting God. That's peace in so many things. That, that, that whole settledness. Be still and know that I am God. And grace, oh my goodness. I need grace and salvation. I need grace to breathe. I need grace in my job. I need grace in my parenting. I need grace in everything that I do. And so sometimes... I don't, know, I don't know about you, but the older I get, my prayers become very generic. God, you know, <laughs> I used to think I did. And here's specifically what you need to do, God, right? When you were younger, did you pray prayers like that a lot? I'm not saying they're wrong to pray now, but those were kind of the, the emphasis of your prayers. This and 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 this. And Paul goes, I want grace and peace. I want grace and peace for you guys. That's what I really want for you guys, and I want God to give it to you. I don't want you to have to go earn it and work and fight and struggle. I want this peace and grace to come from God. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's not a long prayer you have to add, right? You can put all the rest of the stuff in there. But And in this, God, give us grace and peace. Give my friends grace and peace. Through the death of somebody, give us grace and peace. Really important. So again... How much high and haughty and mighty and showing off do you think the Corinthians is? If they understood what Paul is saying here, what's he already doing? Here's the balloon. Pop. Or if nothing else, he's gently sticking a pin in and letting it start deflating. He's already softening them up just in his greeting. And I think a lot of times if we thought in those terms, life would be so much better. Now, let's move on to 
thanksgiving. So this begins at verse 4 through 9. It says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to given you in Christ Jesus. Okay. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking any gift as you wait for the revealing of uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who sustains you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to stop there because if you're, you're going to notice here a pattern. Paul, the last thing he states in each section is the setup for the next topic he's going to talk about. Because if you notice here, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And then what does he talk about? He talks about the grace of God. And at the end of this one, he's going to say, God is faithful by whom you are called into fellowship with the son, Jesus Christ. And then he's going to go talk about divisions because you were called into the fellowship. Why are there divisions? See the difference? And this is kind of the, the argument pattern that you'll see as Paul writes this. And so what does he start off with? He says, first off, I give thanks to my God. All right, again, that's very common in this particular structure. Because of you, you know, always, for you because why why am i giving thanks to god be, for you because the grace of god that was given to you in christ jesus so right there he says if no other reason i give thanks that god has saved you he has given you at least that level of grace you ever been thankful for people being saved now i'll ask you the second question have you ever been thankful for people being sanctified? Don't we get all excited about the missionary stories? No, oh, they're all saved. It's like, okay, well, 10 years later, oh, they're all saved. Well, and what do you think this letter's all about? Them being saved? No, this is about them being sanctified. So maybe we need to learn to be a little bit more thankful about people being sanctified because you know what? It is a huge blessing. Not saying that being saved isn't because you can't be sanctified unless you are. That's a huge blessing too. But in the Christian life, you're saved and then you stop, right? You saved and then the rest of your life, God works on you. And he says, I am excited because God has saved you and the grace of God was given to you. But watch what he then adds to this. He says, it wasn't just your salvation that I'm giving thanks for that grace, but in every way you were enriched in him. Okay, so again, you are enriched in him. So this is what God is doing in your life, in him, not in your own works, not in your own doing, but in him, in all speech and in all knowledge. Now, why would he say such a thing as in all speech and all knowledge? Remember our background. What do you think was really important that, that, you know, Paul's not going to take away from the Corinthians here. He's, he's telling them that God has richly blessed them. And he has richly blessed them in all speech and all knowledge. He says, in other words, you, you understand. You know how to speak. You know the words. You know, you know what's going on. God's blessed you in that. But what is their speech and their knowledge? What are they, what are they going to be doing with it that Paul's going to have to correct? taking pride in it. Look how eloquent I am. Look at the thing that I'm doing. Look at the stuff that I'm saying. Look at all the knowledge and wisdom I have. And he's like, I'm really glad that God gave you this knowledge and he gave you this wisdom, but you've forgotten who it's from because you think it's about you. Oh, Corinthians, what, has, what do you have that hasn't been given to you? He reminds them of that later, right? He says, but I'm thankful God has given you this. See, isn't it, isn't it amazing? He can, on one hand, be thankful that God has given them something, and on the other hand, chastise them for misusing it and misunderstanding it and misapplying it. Isn't it interesting? So he can be, so, have you ever been thankful for some, some skill somebody has? At the same time, you kind of go, oh, you shouldn't have used it that way, right? I'm really glad there are people who know how to pick locks, as long as they're not using it to break into my house. <laughs> Right? So there's the knowledge I'm thankful for, but the application, not so much. Right? 
especially when you lock in, you know, you lock your key in your car and you're like, oh, how do I get it out? I'm glad there are locksmiths. I'm not so happy about the thieves. So he can be thankful for these gifts, this knowledge, then he's going to have to correct how they're using it. So again, be thankful for what God has given you and others. Now make sure they're used right. And so what he continues on, he says, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. Now scholars debate on what that means, but whatever it does, it was confirmed that they understood that Christ was amongst them. All right? And some look at it as there's gifts being demonstrated. There are certain things that Paul said, you know, I didn't come with words and mighty stuff. I came with power so that it might be confirmed among you. You can see the gospel was confirmed among you. The testimony was confirmed among you. And again, I know that gets people real squishy. Oh my goodness, you know, gifts and whatever. Well, this was pretty normal then, right? Why would he need to do that? To confirm it. Doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't Paul himself say, what do the Greeks seek? Knowledge and wisdom. What do the Jews seek? Signs. Well, he said, I'm going to be able to show you exactly what I've done. And yet God has confirmed among you this testimony. And so what? So that you are not lacking in any gift. Now, it may be the gift of salvation. It may be other gifts. Don't know. It's just any gift. Anything that you should have in Christ He's confirmed it, and you have been given it. Now, here's the interesting one. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Why has he put that in there? Why is he thankful that you've been given these gifts, and you, if the testimony has been confirmed, and you have speech, and you have knowledge, and you have all these things, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he put that phrase in there? You're supposed to be using them. You're supposed to be using them while you're waiting. You should be looking forward to this. Now you should be using the gifts God's given you. Working out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? He says, I'm thankful, but what is he going to challenge the Corinthians with their understanding of what it means to wait? Oh, the resurrection's already come. Some of you have been saying that. No, it hasn't. You, your lived out eschatology in times, the way you're living is not in accord with you waiting and using the gifts that you're supposed to have while you're waiting for the revelation, right? And praying for it. In other words, your life is not in conformity while you wait. So that's why he says, as you wait for the revealing. In other words, that's what we should be waiting for, right? That's what we're looking forward to. And we need to live in that manner. Not, I'm looking for my next paycheck. That's good. But that's not what my hope is set on. So now he continues. And he says, and what's going to happen while you're waiting for this revealing? Who will sustain you to the end? if you will, the perseverance of the saints. God is going to get you through it. And isn't it good that God gets us through it? Because if it was up to us, how many of us would make it? I wouldn't. I don't have that strength. But He will sustain you to the end. And how is He going to sustain you? Well, you're going to be bruised and battered and you're going to have some challenges, but you're guiltless. Huh, have you ever thought about that? No matter what, you're guiltless. And I don't know, I've done a lot of counseling with people and they go, I know Christ saved people. Okay. I know the past sins were forgiven. Okay. I know he saved me. And I know my past sins were forgiven. Wondering about the present. But what about the future ones? You're going, wait a second. The future ones were your sins back when those people, so... Were they doubting that God could save you? <laughs> Isn't it interesting how we get wrapped up in, well, it hasn't happened yet, so maybe it's not going to. He saved us, guiltless, until the end. Now, I'm glad of that because I screw up on a routine basis. But he still says, not guilty. He sustains me through those trials, through those difficulties, through that challenge of life as he's sanctifying, as 
us. See all the stuff that Paul's just being thankful for for these people and how we should be thankful for these same things? Isn't it amazing what God is, does and how we can be thankful for it? And what is it going to be? Guiltless to the end in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when he reveals himself that day, guiltless to the end. And he sustains us through it. I'm so thankful to God for you guys because he has called you men and women and Corinthians out of all of this. And here's what he's doing. I am so thankful to God for that. You might want to just read through the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians as your prayer every week. Just understanding what that says is a powerful thing. Now, verse 9, this is where he's going to transition. He says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you notice, he's coming back. He says, and God is faithful. All right. So I've told you this. I'm thankful for this. And God is faithful. He's sustainer. He's guilt free, etc. By whom you were called into fellowship with his son. Jesus is our brother. He is God, but he is our brother. A relationship. It's not about theology, though you want to know your theology, and you will find out this morning as I preach how bad when theology goes off, how bad things get. (laughs) But it's about a fellowship with Christ. It's about a relationship with a person. And he says, God is faithful who called you into that. Jesus Christ, our Lord, that's who he is. You're going, well, why did he put that in there? If he says, I'm thankful for the, that you, he's faithful and you were called into fellowship with him, and this is a letter that we're going to see is corrective in nature, what do you think one of the first problems he's going to address is? Lack of fellowship <laughs> amongst believers who are in fellowship. You ever thought about that? You're in fellowship in Christ, but why aren't you getting along that way? He's your brother. Maybe you need a good rap on the head. Oh, by the way, Paul is an apostle. By the will of God, I'm going to help you with that one. Because you need it. So, the divisions. Now, it's interesting here is this section all the way through almost all of chapter 4 is the reports from Chloe's people before he goes and addresses the issues that were in the letter. So they were so important, he says, I need to go deal with this first before I even go deal with the other stuff we've been talking about. Does that make sense? Have you ever, somebody's given you a task and suddenly something else comes up and you go, wow, I got to really address this before we even talk about that? Yes, you guys got into a squabble over that. But I've also heard you are worshiping Satan. Okay, let's go deal with that one first before we worry about, you know, did you hit your brother? Priorities. What's important? So he's going to address these issues. And look what he says. He says, I appeal to you. Okay, so this is an appeal. He's saying, all right, guys, I, 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 need to, I need to appeal to you about this. Brothers. So he's not calling them sinners, horrible people, I hate you, or God's eyes. You're my brothers, and I'm going to appeal to you as a brother. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, okay, let me remind you whose we are, your Lord, our Lord, my Lord, the Lord of all. I want to appeal to you by this as brothers as I address these problems. How how well would our conversations go if we started that way? As opposed to, I'm here to get you told, as they say in the South. I'm here to get you told. No, I appeal to you as a brother who we both love the Lord. I recognize that. You recognize that. Let's come and, and reason together, if you will. And he says that you all agree. Okay, Paul's a conformist. Okay, agree. Everything I say, is that what he's really talking about? Is this some doctrinal thing when he starts off that you agree? He's talking about fellowship and he's talking about brothers and he's talking about I appeal to you. And then he says that you all agree. What's he want you to be in agreement with first before we talk about anything else? 
What do you think? What's that? Yeah, they're all brothers in Christ. Let's start there. If you begin with we're not all brothers and sisters in Christ, where do you think the conversation's going to go? Nowhere. And that you've been saved, and that you've been blessed, and that you have gifts, and God has been rich to you. I want you all to agree on this stuff. I want you to understand this stuff. I want you to be part of all these things. Because this is important to begin our conversation with. Remember, most people's logic is reasonable. Not always. Otherwise, it's not logic. It's just emotion. But if they're logical, they will come to logical conclusions. Where will be the difference between your logical conclusions and their logical conclusions? Where will it be found? Come on, all you debate people, all you... Where's it going to be found? It's going to be found in your premise, your presupposition. If I am an engineer and I decide that I can build I-beams to support heavy structures out of red vines, I can build a logical conclusion to that and my building will fall down because my premise is wrong. Now, don't go. I'm sure somebody on YouTube's already decided, hey, oh, let's go figure out how to build red vines. I mean, no. <laughs> yeah, be, it would be great. You could eat the building. The building would be eaten, so yeah. <laughs> but it's your premise that is faulty. Your logic, no matter how impeccable, will, be, will lead you to wrong conclusions. And so he says, I want you, in the name of the Lord, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you. So if you start with those premises, we're all brothers, and we agree on that, and here's what Christ has given us. Now, what kind of division do we have? Right now, no divisions. We're in agreement. Now, maybe we vary on some applications, but we've already got our premises correct. Now we can discuss things properly. That there be no divisions among you. But, instead of the divisions, here's what I want. That you be united what? In the same mind and the same judgment. There's, I want you to have the same mind. What kind of mind do you want them to have? The mind of Christ. Oh, I thought it was going to be Paul. Ah, see, it's the mind of Christ that we want, right? And Paul does tell them to be imitators of me as I am of what? Me? Of Christ. As far as you see Christ in me, be imitators of that. He says, so I want you to be in agreement. I don't want any divisions. I want you to be of the same mind and judgment. So again, if you begin by the same premises, the odds are you're going to be really close, though maybe not exact. You're going to come to the same judgments. You're going to think the same way. You're going to come to the same conclusions. Or at least close enough. You're in the bread box. You know, it's this big and, you know, you're over here, I'm here. That's still good. And each situation and subtlety might have a little bit of different flavor to it. But we're all still going to be in that. Does this make sense? Look at what he's saying. This is why I don't want you to have divisions. I don't want this stuff in here. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people. In other words, this is a verbal report by people, whoever Chloe is, we're not sure, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And what I mean is each one of you says this. Now, look, this is the quarreling. Here, let me give you an example of what the quarreling that's been reported to me. You say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So what are they doing here? They're taking their knowledge, they're taking their gifts, and then what are they doing with it? They're becoming loyal to the individual that, that they prefer. Yeah, they're becoming loyal to the preference to somebody they prefer. Now, is preference okay? Yeah, yeah preference is okay. But when preference steps beyond, you know, the thumia, I like this guy, becomes the epithumia, I'm of this guy. How many times have you been trapped into that one? I really like the writings of so-and-so. Or I've been studying this guy. Oh, he's the greatest person in the world. And Well, that's okay. You learn something. That's great. You're excited. Cool. But if you don't go, well, if you disagree with anything that guy says, Oh, we got a problem now because you have another guy and you have another guy and you have another guy. And now we all start saying, well, I'm of, I always use this joke, so forgive me. I'm of John Piper. I'm of John MacArthur. I'm of John Stott. Pick your favorite John, you know. 
And as soon as you start doing that, as godly as all those men are, and as much as they study and love the Lord, etc., if those become who you are of, you miss the point. Because Paul goes, is Christ divided? I want you to be of one mind. Here's who you're in fellowship with. Is Christ divided? Or is it he's given Paul a certain ministry and Apollos a certain ministry and Peter a certain ministry and, 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 and all these people a ministry that he has called them into to serve him where he places them? Praise God. But if you think that Christ is divided because you pick these people, you've already are no longer of one mind. You're not in agreement. You have already said there is variance within Christ himself. You missed the point, and therefore you're going to have divisions. Therefore, you're going to start quarreling. See how, this, how he's, he's making this argument? And then he goes, is Christ divided? And then he asks him another question. Was Paul crucified for you? Because he says, you guys, some people, I'm of Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Paul guy. He's like, I didn't die for you. Why do you think there's anything special about me? Yeah, God gave me a task. He gave me a role. He showed me the sufferings I'm going to deal with it. I wasn't crucified for you, though. I have no relevance to you beyond what God has given me to serve you with. Or were you baptized in my name? I baptize you in the name of Paul. It's like, that's not it. You were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where your baptism is in God, not Paul. And then he goes, you know, and because you guys are so out of bounds on all this stuff, I am really glad that I didn't baptize in you. Well, maybe Crispus, Gaius, and that, okay, well, maybe there's the household of Stephanus. But other than that, I don't know anybody else I even baptized. So why in the world are you arguing that, you know, I'm of a Paul? Now, I want to give you a little historic note there. Uh, later on in church history, there became a big issue in the church, especially after all of the persecutions and all this other stuff, I won't go into the details of it, of it, your baptism didn't count because you were baptized by that guy. And there became a big issue of does baptism count if you're not done by a godly person or later in disrepute or we find out something that I didn't like about him. Did your baptism count? I'm like, for what? Yeah, they didn't baptize you, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't say these words in this way and whatever. And Paul's, Paul's going, seriously, people? Do you even understand what baptism is? Do you understand what it means to be in Christ? Do you understand any of this stuff? You guys are arguing about this stuff. Again, faulty premises lead to faulty conclusions and fights. No unity. Is this a messed up church yet? What do you think is going to come out of these things? Oh, we just get along and go along, right? Yeah. All one big buddy is with us. No, this is going to be a mess. I always ask people, they say, oh, I wish I was in the New Testament times. It was so much simpler then. I'm like, which Bible have you been reading? What church did you want to be part of? <laughs> Certainly not Corinth. And so he continues on and he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That's why I came. That's my role. That's the task. It wasn't about me baptizing you or not. And not from words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Think about Corinth. Think about what these people were arguing about in their words and their knowledge and their wisdom and their power. What was one of the things the way you gained prestige in the city of Corinth? What was it? Debating. What's that? Debating. Debating, eloquence, great oratory, rhetoric. And he said, if I came to you like that, and I came to you like everything else you're used to. I am like anybody else. And you're now thinking about me and how well I speak. 
And Paul evidently was not a good speaker. He's kind of like Moses, you know, give me Aaron because you know I can't talk. He was a powerful writer, <laughs> but maybe he wasn't so eloquent in person. He's actually accused of that. And we see here that it's about the gospel. It, this is what I came to give. This is what God has reached you. And why have you already started wandering away from it? And if I came that way, as opposed to in power, so if you notice like, okay, there's got to be major signs and all. He said, I came to you as you needed to hear the gospel. I came to you as you needed to have it presented to you. Because if I presented it differently, it would have robbed the gospel of its power. Because you would have put me in the category of everybody else. Why does Paul not take money from these people? What was one of the things that you did to have prestige? Your philanthropy and hosting people and giving them money and having them see I've got this Paul guy and look how eloquent he is and I'm supporting him. I'm a patron of the gospel, right? I don't want any of you guys to even think I have the right to take it. I could take it, but because of you, I won't take it. Were there other places where he's like, sure, no problem? Philippians. Yep, Philippians gave him money. He said, nobody else supported you, but you Philippians, you did. Thank you. But I'm not going to do anything with you, Corinthians, that is going to get in the way of you understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ and living in a way that you're supposed to live. I won't do that. How many times do we do things that get in the way of the gospel? Because we have to do it our way. And how much do we give up that we should, you know, how many should we keep that we should give up because of us? And Paul says, no, no, no. Christ who was, oh, wait a second, God, didn't think that thing to be, that's something to be grasped, but emptied himself taking on the form of a bondservant. And he died. And he paid the penalty of our sin. So if he did that, I'll give up all the rest of this stuff for you guys. But you guys are already on the wrong foot. You're arguing from the wrong premise. You've begun the wrong way, and yet I still can give thanks for you for what God has done. I'm sitting here as I'm studying this. I'm going, is Paul schizophrenic or what? I'm giving thanks for you, uh, and you're really screwed up. But isn't it cool? Because we can give thanks for what God has done in a life and still be really screwed up. And what's God then going to do? Save us again? No, he's going to sanctify us. And that's where our humility, that's where our grace, that's where falling on him has to come from. And this is what we're going to see as we flow out in the book. Paul's going to be pretty tough on him. But if you notice what his heart is, what he wants their mind to be, what he wants to be the fruit of these things. And that's what we're going to see as we continue on in our next lesson. But it gets darker before, you know, it gets lighter. And unfortunately, by the time Paul gets to 2 Corinthians, he's like, I'm not sure you guys even get it. I mean, have, I, have, I, have I wasted my time on you people? He starts wondering out loud. When Paul starts wondering out loud, that's not a good thing. I, not that any of us have ever wondered, right, or out loud or <laughs> quietly or about ourselves. Am I saved? Do I really get any of this? Thank you.